Hey friends, Pastor Bill Walden here. Welcome to Build Up the Church. Build Up the Church is a ministry that exists to build up Christians in their faith through uh, accurate teaching of God's Word and uh, good application explained. Also, uh, Build Up the Church exists to help unbelievers or those who are unfamiliar with the Bible to see the reasonableness of the Bible, uh, God's Word, and to hopefully to come into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So welcome. Today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 4 as we're continuing on in the book of Romans. Let me read the first four verses. The Apostle Paul has been explaining uh, through verses uh, chapters 1 through 3 uh, the universality of sin that in chapter 1, though God has made himself evident, people throw off restraint and uh, sin boldly and have a moral downward spiral. Chapter 2, he talks about people who think they're better than those in chapter 1. The moral critic who has a set of morals but violates them. The religious critic who has a set of religious standards but violates them, that they're also guilty. In chapter 3, he goes on to just develop the whole idea that uh, everybody, if you will, from A to Z, from top to bottom, from side to side, has sinned and fallen short of God's glory. He, he does introduce the idea in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, that there is a righteousness that is available to mankind. Righteousness could also be translated, there is a rightness. There is a way to be right with God. But it's apart from the law. It's apart from performance. It's apart from good works. It's apart from obeying or trying to obey any moral or religious standard. It's righteousness that's given to people if when they believe in Jesus Christ, that Jesus paid the price for their sins, the righteousness of Christ, the rightness of Christ, the holiness of Christ is credited to that person, not by works, they don't earn it, but by faith. And here in Romans chapter 4, the Apostle Paul continues on with that same theme, and he brings up two great patriarchs, the two great men of faith from the Old Testament. The first is Abraham. Romans 4 verse 1, what, shall we, what then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? In other words, what did Abraham discover in his own life according to his human experience? For if Abraham, verse 2, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. If Abraham had been made right with God by his performance, by always doing the right thing, then he could boast. But that wasn't the case. Abraham didn't always do the right thing. Verse 3, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as a debt. So Paul here is, is seeking to establish that justification by faith is not a new idea. Uh, he's probably anticipating those who would say, Paul, um, you've created something new. We've never heard about this before. There's no precedent for it. We don't know if it's from God or if it's just man's invention or if you created it. So that's something that you thought up. So Paul is going to take the potential would-be critic back to the Old Testament to show them that this idea of having a right relationship with God through faith and not through works is not something new, but goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. So, if the gospel of justification by faith was a new idea, then essentially Paul would be seeming to make the Old Testament irrelevant or non-applicable. The Jews would have claimed that the gospel invalidated the Old Testament, and so Paul is showing them that this principle of justification by faith, not by works, is as old as humankind. So Paul starts out with Abraham. He was highly respected among the Jewish nation. He was considered the father of the faith. Here are some verses in the Old Testament that speak about the importance of the person Abraham. This is from Isaiah 51, verses 1 and 2. Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the hole from the pit, and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to your father Abraham, and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. Here Paul, for, for those who embraced the Old Testament, who lived in Rome, Paul is saying, consider Abraham. He is like the rock from which you were cut. He was like uh, 
if a man was was digging uh, a hole, uh, that's where you were discovered in that place where man was excavating for truth or excavating for life. Look to your to Abraham, your father. God says, I called him alone and I blessed him and I increased him. So Paul is pointing out that Abraham received special favor from God. He goes on to say this in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? So there the author is, is proclaiming to God about God. You drove out the people, the wicked people of the land, and you gave it to your people, to the descendants of Abraham, who is your friend. Once again, not something that Abraham earned or his people earned, but it was a gift from God. Abraham had been the special recipient of God's favor in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. God had found Abraham, who was an idolater living in an ungodly country, and said, leave your family, leave your country, come to a land that I will show you and I will bless you, and I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And so once again, Paul here is anticipating, either anticipating or actually refuting uh, the argument that some might say, Paul, you're inventing this, this idea of justification by faith alone, not by works, this idea of being right with God, not by, not by works, but by faith alone. You're, you're making this up. This is something new. And Paul's saying, no, look back to your own patriarch. Those of you who have a Jewish background, look back to, to Abraham. God counted him as righteous or as right with God because of his faith. Abraham, Paul, excuse me, Paul asserts that Abraham was justified by faith and not by good works. If Abraham was justified by good works, then he has something to boast about. But look at here in Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? In other words, if you could have an interview with the, the departed Abraham and say, what did you discover about uh, your relationship with God? Abraham would say, well, I didn't earn it. It was given to me. Yes, I obeyed the Lord, but I also failed the Lord. And my rightness with God or my relationship with God was a gift from God. The, the things that I received were blessings from God. Paul says in Romans chapter 4, verse 2, If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. This is especially important for those who feel that they can make themselves good enough for God to accept them. But if that was possible, then that person could boast, look how well I've done. I've made myself acceptable to God by my good works, by my perfect performance. And by the way, perfection is what God expects because he is a perfect God. And so none can do that. None can boast. Now, Paul very wisely takes us back to the Old Testament and in establishing the validity of the gospel message here in the New Testament writing, he very wisely goes back to the beginning of the Old Testament. Romans chapter 4, verse 3, what does the scripture say? And then he quotes from Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. God had promised Abraham a son. And Abraham was beyond the, the age of being able to bear children, as was his wife. And it had been many years, and Abraham walked out one night uh, out of his tent and said, God, you know, uh, you promised to give me a son, uh, the one that's going to inherit all my, my, my belongings, everything that I have, is, is just uh, a servant, a head servant in my household. And God said, Abraham, look up at the stars. That's how numerous your descendants are going to be. And it says that Abraham believed God. And at that moment, without, without works, but through faith, God said, Abraham, you're right with me. You're righteous with me. I'm, I'm crediting to you. I'm giving you a right standing with me. Why? Because Abraham produced a son at this point? No. Because he had obeyed perfectly? No. But because he believed. And so Paul is establishing this idea of the gospel the idea of justification by faith and rightness with God by faith all the way back in the book of Genesis. 
The rabbis believe that Abraham performed the entire law even before it was given as an anticipation or as, as an instinct. But Abraham was not made righteous by faith, but was accounted as righteous by faith. This is an important distinction. He's not made righteous by faith. When Abraham believed, he didn't suddenly do the right thing all the time. He was accounted as righteous by faith. And this is a, like a banking term or a mathematic term. God credited the position or the stature of rightness with God to Abraham because of his faith. By faith, today, the Christian is not made righteous, but we are accounted as righteous. If you're a Christian today, at some point in your past, in your history, excuse me here, you believed in Jesus. You gave your life to Christ. At that moment, a position or a standing with God of righteousness was accounted to you. It was given to you. It was credited to you. That doesn't mean that in practical terms you were righteous all the time. And we know that for a fact, if you're a Christian, you know that you're not righteous all the time. But there's two understandings or two differentiations of this idea of righteousness, if you will. The first one is being called righteous or considered righteous in a right relationship with God through faith. The second one is the actual practical working out of righteousness in our life. We first receive the standing of righteousness with God. God looks at us and says, and says, I don't consider you a sinner any longer. I consider you my righteous son, my righteous daughter. And then through the giving of the Holy Spirit, he begins to work out righteousness in our hearts. After we are counted as righteous by faith, then God begins to make us righteous practically. The term here, counted, Romans chapter 4, verse 4, now to him who works... The wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. That's clearly understandable. When a, when a man works a job, you know, I remember working jobs and waiting for my paycheck on Friday and then trying to make it to the bank before the bank closed. I expected those wages. I earned them. I, de I deserved them. In fact, I could demand them if I wanted to. They were mine. I earned them. But justification is not something that we earn. Paul says in Romans 4, 4, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Grace is a gift. So when I would go to receive my paycheck from my boss, I didn't say, oh, thank you for this gift. I said, thank you for giving me what you owe me. And so grace speaks of a gifting from God. That phrase there, wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Uh, let me give you some definition of that word counted. An accounting term, it means to put into somebody's account. Kenneth Wiest, in his commentary on the Greek New Testament, says this, Abraham possessed righteousness in the same manner as a person who would possess a sum of money placed in his account in a bank. It was placed there. If I place money in your account in your, in your bank, you didn't earn it, it was gifted to you, but it's, it's 100% yours, I put it into your account and you receive it. The book of Philemon is about a, a runaway slave, a, a man named Onesimus, who ran away from his master, Philemon. Onesimus ran away and somehow encountered the Apostle Paul. Paul led him to Christ, and Onesimus became a, a, an assistant to Paul. But Paul sent him back to Philemon and said, Philemon, please receive him as you would receive me, and now even more so because he's a Christian. And, and then Paul said this about Onesimus. He said this to Philemon the master. If he has wronged you or owes anything to you, put that on my account. Charge it to me. It's not that Paul had wronged, potentially wronged Philemon. It's that Onesimus potentially wronged Philemon. But Paul said, put it on my account. It, was, it would be credited to Paul. Paul would say, I'll, I'll pay. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us. He paid for our sins. So God could credit us or put into our account, put us in the place of standing with him, a righteous position. When a laborer works, he earns his wages. The boss is indebted to him. So there are two ways that money can be put into an account. I've said it. I'll say it again. You can earn it 
or it can be a gift. And when it comes to righteousness with God, it can only be a gift because we can never make ourselves clean enough, holy enough, uh, good enough to earn that relationship with God. When a man believes the gospel, God counts that man as righteous. Let's move on. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And so Paul keeps using this mathematical term, this banking term, this accounting term. Notice in verse 5, to him who does not work, but believes. And so now Paul is saying, to the one who believes for righteousness, he believes on him who justifies the ungodly. Notice, guys, who does God justify? The ungodly. We're all ungodly. Paul established that in Romans chapter 3. All have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one, and the wages of sin is death. And so God justifies the ungodly. How do we go from being in the position of being ungodly to the being in the position of being right with God or having righteousness with God? He tells us in verse 5, But to him who does not work to be accepted by God, but believes who takes God at his promise. For God so loved the world that whoever, uh, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will receive everlasting life. And so this is that same idea. To him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. David Gusick, great Bible commentator, EnduringWord.com, you can see his commentaries online. David says this, Everyone who has ever been saved, Old or New Testament, is saved by grace through faith, Old or New Testament, through their relationship of trusting love, through their relationship of trusting the love of God. Because of the New Covenant, we have the benefits of salvation that the Old Testament saint did not have, but we do not have the different manner of salvation. The Old Testament saints were made right with God because they believed the promises of God, though they were only looking forward to a shadow. They didn't have the, clear, the clarity of the gospel message that we in the New Testament times have. We have the, the additional blessing of, of being filled with the Holy Spirit, which they did not have. The Old Testament saints were visited by the Spirit and empowered by the Spirit, but never indwelt by the Spirit. Only until after Jesus paid for our sins fully and completely could, could we then be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But the point that David Gusick makes is this. It's the same mechanics, if you will. The Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints, we, in these days, we believe in the promises of God and, it's considered, and we are considered righteous before God. So verse 5 once again and moving on. But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. What a relief this can bring to the person who's laboring under the misguided idea that they need to make themselves right with God. What a relief this can bring to the person who is so aware of their own sinfulness and their own failures and feels like, I've got to make up for this somehow. I've got to make things right with God. We can never enter into a relationship to begin with or to repair a bad relationship through, through any kind of works at all. Though intentions are good and all of that, I won't discount that, we can never be made right with God by our performance. It's always, always, always by faith in the promises of God, by faith in Jesus Christ, the one whom the Father in heaven sent forth to be the propitiation, the, the mercy seat, for our sins. Verse 5 again going on, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. God justifies the ungodly. Maybe you're watching this today and you've never said yes to Christ. You're ungodly. I would never say that you don't do some things nice once in a while. Ungodly people do nice things on occasion. They say nice things. They think nice things. But God doesn't judge you for those things. He judges you for your wrongdoing. But God justifies the ungodly. 
And we have to admit that we're ungodly before we can come into that relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted to him for righteousness. Verse 6, just as David, now Paul's going to go on to another great Old Testament hero of the Jewish people, just as King David also described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Now these next two verses are quotes from Psalm 32, and we're going to go there in just a moment. David described the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes or counts righteousness apart from works. David discovered and understood the same thing that Abraham did, that God forgives and imputes righteousness. He doesn't make us earn it because we can't earn it. David goes on to say in verses 7 and 8 of Romans chapter 4, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Now, he's, Paul is quoting from Psalm 32. And as I turn there, and maybe you want to turn there as well, it is generally believed that David wrote this psalm after his well-known sin with Bathsheba. It was the time of year when kings would go out to war, but David stayed behind, and he went out on his rooftop one, one evening, and they had like patio rooftops, and he looked down and saw a woman uh, you know, bathing, unclothed. And he wanted her and sent for her, and he had relations with her, and she became pregnant. Her name was Bathsheba, and her husband was named Uriah, and he was off fighting a war for King David. Bathsheba came to David and said, I'm with child. And so David said, I've got to try to cover up my sin. So he thought this. He said, I'll call for Uriah. I'll bring him off the front lines under the guise of wanting to know how the battle's going. And then I'll send him home, and surely he'll have relations with his wife. Well, Uriah came in from the front lines, reported to David, and then David sent him home. But Uriah wouldn't go home. He says, how can I go home, sleep in my own bed when my comrades, my fellow soldiers, are out there sleeping in the field? And he, he, he didn't go home to his wife. Well, this went on and on, and David even got him drunk and tried to send him home, and he wouldn't do it. So David devised a plan. He would send Uriah back to the front lines with a letter to his commander, saying, put Uriah on the front lines and allow him to be killed. And so David committed adultery, and David arranged for the, the murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. It took about a year before David was, was found out by the Lord. I mean, God knew it right away, but it took about a year before God chose to reveal to David that he knew, and he used the prophet Nathan who told a story, and David said, oh, the, the villain of that story should be punished. And, and Nathan said, David, you're the man. You've sinned this great way. It's believed that after that event, that David wrote this psalm, and I'm going to read it to you. Follow along if you have your Bibles open. Psalm 32, verses 1 through 5. Notice here how David is saying, God forgives us when we confess our wrongdoing. David wrote this, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. There's honesty. David says, When I kept silent, my bones grew old. And this is the tragic result of those who try to hide their sins. Through my groaning all the day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. David felt that internal heaviness of heart and that heavy hand of God, if you will, upon his own soul as he tried to hide his sin from the world. But notice Psalm 32 verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you, so David confessed his sin. My iniquity I have not hidden. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. This then is what the Apostle Paul is quoting in Romans chapter 4. King David, a hero of the Jewish people, a hero of the Old Testament, also committed heinous sins, 
but his his right standing with God wasn't regained by him doing good works. It was it was regained and reestablished, if you will, through confession of sin and through asking God for forgiveness. David used some words here. In verse 7, David claimed to have lawless deeds and sins. He had sinned much. He owned them. He didn't sweep them under the rug. He didn't say, I just have a character defect or something like that. He confessed that he had sinned. He confessed his wrongdoing. He agreed with God about his own condition. He uses some phrases here, lawless deeds. Let me give you the definitions. Lawless deeds means contempt and violation of law, disrespecting and hating the law of God and deliberately violating it. No attempt to obey it, no appreciation of it. David says here, blessed is the man whose lawless deeds are forgiven. And he's, in essence, he's confessing and saying, I hated the law of God when I wanted my own way. He said this, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. Sins means to miss the mark or to wander from the path. So David was saying, not only have I you know, failed to do the, the, the right thing, I have purposely and deliberately done the wrong thing. But God, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. You've forgiven me. You've reestablished me, my relationship with you. Blessed is the man who God shall not impute to him. God will not count that man as sinful. Instead, David calls himself blessed, and that means to be spiritually prosperous. Let me read Psalm 32, verse 1 again with that paraphrase. Spiritually prosperous is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Spiritually prosperous is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. Spiritually prosperous. That's something that we need to consider about our own lives. Are you spiritually prosperous as you're watching this video or listening to the audio of this video? Are you spiritually prosperous? I think it's so natural for us as human beings to want to fix things. To want to make things right with God through our efforts, through making promises, New Year's resolutions, promising God, promising others that we won't, we won't do this again or won't do that again. Every time we promise that we're going to change forever, guys, we're just setting ourselves up for failure because we can't even keep the, the, our own standards, much less God's standards. But spiritually prosperous, David says, is the one whose transgression is forgiven as we confess our sins, whose sin is covered. Spiritually prosperous is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, but instead imputes or accounts a righteous standing because that man, that woman have faith. Let me ask you a, a series of questions, maybe for yourself, maybe for someone else. Are you spiritually prosperous? You might prosper in many things, but be spiritually bankrupt. And there are certainly many people like that in the world. Health and wealth eventually fade away. And they can't save you. They can't reserve a place in heaven for you. Health and wealth cannot bring extended blessings for the soul. They just bring short-term gratifications. Psalm 106, verse 16. The people were asking God for many things. The Old Testament Jews and it says he gave them their request, but he sent leanness to their soul. Spiritually prosperous or leanness of soul. Soul is that internal part of you, that intangible you that goes on forever and ever. Are you spiritually prosperous or is there leanness of soul? Another set of questions, are you trying to earn your way to heaven? Do you believe that God ought to accept you because you've done some good or that you're better than other people? Or that your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds. Even our courts of law don't say we are not guilty if we've done more good things than bad things. The courts of law condemn us for, for the bad that we've done, the wrong things that we've done. Heaven is the same way. Romans 3 verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the flesh, no one will be justified by the deeds of the law, no one will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So many people just are trying to earn their way to heaven. You can't earn your way to heaven. It takes 100% proof.
performance. And if you're old enough to be listening or watching this video, you've already failed. You've already lived long enough to do the wrong thing. Abraham and David both needed to be justified by faith. They were great men of faith and heroes of the faith. Abraham is called the father of the faithful. And yet they still needed to be justified by faith. They were not accepted because of their works. And we are not any better than they are. Hopefully you don't think that you're, somehow you're the exception. You're not and I'm not. Finally, are you ready and willing to make the same confession as King David did in Psalm 32? That you've sinned and broken the laws of God. It's a good thing to humble yourself and admit the truth that God has already been saying about you. To agree with God. Are you ready to agree with Him about your spiritual condition? Are you ready to ask for forgiveness? We come to the end of ourselves. Don't you want to experience the blessedness that David spoke about, that spiritual prosperity of soul? Don't you want God to not hold your sins against you? So maybe that's a word for you. Maybe that's some words that you can share with a friend or a family or a loved one, an acquaintance. We have to ask these searching questions because there is a day when each one of us will stand before God and he'll either be welcoming us into his kingdom or he'll be judging us. And he knows every sin that we've committed. But God does, has no desire that any should perish. He wants all to be saved, to repent and come to re uh, to come to repentance and to come to salvation. God mercifully waits for people to say yes to him. So I hope that each one of you who's watching or listening have said yes to Jesus. Let me offer a word of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your grace, your mercy, your love. And thank you that you haven't made it so that we have to earn our way to you. What an exhausting task and an impossible task that would be. Thank you that you make us right with you when we agree with you, confess our sins, and ask for forgiveness, and we are immediately in a right relationship with you. So that may that be so for all who are watching, all who are listening. It's just that easy. So thank you, Lord. Bless each one watching or listening now, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for watching. If you're interested in more of these videos, I have a YouTube channel. It's called Build Up the Church, Pastor Bill Walden, dash Build Up the Church. You can go there and see more teachings and uh, you can share that with your friends. So thanks so much for watching. God bless. Bye-bye.